So for a message this morning, I, uh, maybe some of this is, doesn't quite make sense at the outset here. I, I titled this message, and you, whenever I do something like this, I always recognize that you could title it something else and it would still make sense. Uh, I titled this Investing in the Kingdom, and I think you understand what I'm, I'm uh, getting at when I say that. I'd like to begin by just quoting or saying what Max Lucado wrote in his um, book, Because of Bethlehem. And I'm not quoting word for word, but he said, at one point he said something like this. He talks about why Jesus had to come and what his mission was. And, and um, at one point he says this, the, the heart of the human problem is the heart. And it may, that may not make sense as to why I'm saying that now, um, but maybe in a little bit it will. And he has another section there. He talks about how as human beings, we, we can be as spiritual as we think, you know, we're just on top and, and all of that. But he said, there's this strange something that as long as we're humans, it doesn't matter what our rank is, our title is, there's a tendency to, and then he describes what he saw children doing, playing King of the Mountain. Just, just you, you, we all, I think most of us, maybe not all of you know what King of the Mountain is. I don't think we should play that game as non-resistant Mennonites, but maybe our children would in, behind the shed or something. But he said, you know, the, the idea is that we, someone is trying to rise to the top and going to stand at the top and... He said, this, the real estate there is really small. There's not much at the top. And whoever's really thinking they're on top are in a constant battle. And I think that his premise was simply that the heart of the human heart, the human character, if not touched by God, always leans toward something it shouldn't. And, and his... His thought process behind that book is that is why Jesus came and none of us, not one of us, should get to the place where we think we've achieved, attained, I'm on a plateau, here we go, I'm born again, I don't need Jesus anymore because we're just going to go back to where we came from. Now, non-Christians operate in, in the king of the mountain world, where they're all trying. But friends, sometimes it happens at church. Sometimes it happens among those that are claiming to be born again. And if it, if it continues, the church community is doomed. It just happens that way. There's a better way. I'd like to begin by reading the most famous, the most popular verse in the Bible that I think of, I, I may be wrong, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We, I didn't need to read that, I know that. I'm, I'm guessing that most of you knew that verse, or even the small children did. And I already preached one message this year on John 3.16, but there's a part of that, that verse that really settled into my heart, in my spirit, and, and really kind of uh, um, pushed me forward to say what I'm saying this morning. And I'm, I'm kind of singling this out, this one line. It says, I hadn't really thought about this before. Now, let's think about investing in the kingdom. For God so loved the world that he gave. And this is what I'd like to say about the nature and the character of God. The love that God has will always give. It will give. And we could talk a whole, we could speak for the rest of this morning about the giving nature and heart of God into man and how he has poured into us and our lives and how it makes a difference. But what I'd like to do is kind of flip that around and say, if indeed we are born again and that love, the love of God is in our hearts, 
then there is something that will always happen. You can't, it's not, it's not something that I have to pretend about. It's not something that I have to, to force myself to do. It's something that just happens. If I'm born again, if you're born again, you are a giving person. You give. You give back to the kingdom. You give because you want to give. It's something that wells up that abundant life that just flows from you. It's not, it's not that I have some traditional thing that I have to give, you know, however much. It's something that comes. It's, it's, it comes with joy. It comes with a smile. It's something we want to do just because of what Jesus did in, at Bethlehem and at the cross, his sacrifice. And this is one of those complete verses. It doesn't just stop at, you know, the love of God, but it talks about all those that believe. We have a, a, a responsibility if we're going to um, experience life. It exposes the loving heart of God. It does that. But it also puts responsibility on top of our shoulders. So love that is motivated by the Holy Spirit always gives. And you might hear me say that again and again. Not grudgingly, not after a long fight, not after an argument, not after excuses, not after saying, well, I guess if that's what's required of me, I'll do it. And, and even if I don't say it, I live that. But generously and willingly, it will give and it will build the kingdom of God in every direction that God calls us to. That is when the love of God is in my and your heart. Not lip service, not saying that we, we somehow have this ideology that I'm born again and now I'm on, here we go. The Holy Spirit generated love actively looks for ways to give. It, it is looking for, it is seeking for ways to give to the kingdom. I know that uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, is, is talking, Paul is talking about giving. And this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about giving, but I'm going to be talking about giving of a different sort than our monetary giving that we do. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Paul is making the argument that the Corinthians... We're generous people, and he goes down the list, and he says, you gave, and, and I don't know if they gave much, but they just gave whatever they had. They, they were just so generous, they, they wanted to give what they had. And so I'm going to read verse uh, 6 and 7, and I'm, not, I'm probably going to be jumping around to some different scriptures instead of a long passage. But it says this, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so I'm taking probably, some would say this out of context because he's talking about money. And I'm talking about something that goes far beyond money. We've, I think there, if I would ask how many of you have heard a message on giving, probably about 95% of your hands would go up. You've all heard a message about giving, and you all know that, that giving a tenth of your income is what God probably expects from you. And we could talk all morning about the equations that line up with the truth of God, but I want to talk about something that's beyond just your money. That is kind of the low-hanging fruit that we just kind of know as good Mennonites that we're supposed to do, and it's up to us, I think it's important. But I'm, I want to talk about giving in ways that exceed and are beyond just our finances. And when I say just our finances, our finances are very important. I'm not saying they're not important at all, but I'm not arguing about that either. I'm just saying that if that's the focus of our giving, then I wonder if we've missed the point and are going to be sadly disappointed even though we go to church all our lives, even though we think we're spiritual, because God is calling us to a higher standard of giving. My focus this morning is on sowing seeds of patience, kindness, and love, forbearance generously, focus on encouragement, investment in relationships, peacemaking, with focus on investment, that may only be realized in eternity. We may never see the results of our investment, 
We may never see it, and that's okay. This type of investment is for eternity, but it affects your environment today. It, it, it affects your mind today. And when I talk about investment, you, what I really want to say this morning, I may be unable to explain properly to you, but I, I, Christians have always invested. Christians that were Christians beyond in name only have always invested in the kingdom. It didn't matter if they were in jail for their faith. You hear story after story where prisoners, Christians, shared one little piece of bread with others because they saw a need. They saw something. They were investing in the kingdom in the darkest place that you can imagine, you or I can imagine. The stories travel through my head of things that people did beyond giving money. I, I remember a story, I can't tell you the names and where to read it in the uh, uh, Martyr's Mirror. There's a man that was in prison. His, his family was at home and finally, it was his time to go to the stake or get his head cut off. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it was during the Reformation time, and he was going to get killed for his faith. But the executioner said, I am not doing that. I can't. His wife and his family have fed me so many times, there's no way I can do that. You know what? They were investing in the kingdom of God. And I think in time, he lost his life too. But be that as it may, that's not in my notes. That It always... We invest because of what God has done for me beyond just giving, beyond just our cultural norm, but giving generously with an open hand to those that, that are around us. Now, I'm going to say, I, I said we invest for eternity, but it makes a difference today in our neighborhood. It's just a natural byproduct. It is like fingers of light piercing a dark world. And we all, I, I don't know if you ever think of this, we all have a little bit of a community on our own. You rub shoulders with people that I don't even know. I do the same. Sometimes I feel like I have another church because I meet so many people that talk about God to me and encourage me. And I think all of you have some of that. And so again, I would argue that if, if all we're going to do is just talk about just the right formula for our, our money and our finances, and that's all we're going to say as far as giving, we've missed it. We've missed it. We've missed the joy of, of being generous. I know the, the parable in Luke, and I think this is a parallel scripture to, to Matthew. I just read Luke uh, chapter 8 in my personal devotion uh, devotions not long ago talks about the sower, and you know the story, how he went out and he sowed, and then he explains the parable, talks about the soil. And uh, I, I think there's, again, I'm maybe misconstruing this a little bit, but let me, let me just say this quickly and not dwell on this much. I think the soil of our heart is very important. But what I want to say is this farmer could have said, I'm not sowing here. There's too much hard ground here. I am not putting any seed where I don't think it's going to prosper. And I know that as soon as I'm done saying this, someone will say, well, you ought not throw your pearls before the swine. You ought, the Bible says that, and you could argue that. However, I want to say this. This farmer sowed in places that maybe were not ideal, and he still sowed. He still invested. He still kept going. And that's what I'm here to encourage you this morning. Keep investing, keep investing, keep giving, keep giving. I'm sure a lot of Christians would say this was a poor steward, a poor move, a poor, um, a poor representation of what God has given me. I don't know if I should even talk about this. I saw an instance here not so long ago, a, a Christian person dealing with a non-Christian and it was a it was a business deal, and obviously I I I don't want to mention any names or or I, I this is just something that just broke my heart. I noticed what was happening. This shrewd Christian business person making sure that this other person would not not even get within a mile of taking advantage of, you know, him being a good steward. And I heard what the non-Christians said later about Christians. And I tell you what, brethren, 
Be generous. Give a little extra. Next time you have a chance, think about the eternal consequences and how that's going to affect. Just, just be very, very careful. And don't just do it to non-Christians. Invest in those that are in the church. Because God is so, he's so focused on us and how we respond and how we give. And this was, this was money this time. But the attitude that went with it just really bothered me. And it still does. And I don't have anything to do with this situation whatsoever. I was just a bystander. But it spoke to me. And I thought to myself, if I need to wait to retire two more days, then I'll gladly give a little more, more money if it makes someone feel better. Maybe that's poor business sense. But I'd rather wait just a couple more days to retire if that's what it takes, if somehow it blesses someone else. If we look at Jesus' ministry on earth, I, I don't need to go, I could read scripture after scripture, and, and we know that Jesus, and I'm not Jesus, and none of us are, but all of us would say, we want to be more like Jesus. We want to keep growing. We want to, to be his, his disciple. He showed generosity to those that could not help themselves. He showed his, his generosity. He invested in this new kingdom in ways that, that stretch my imagination. I know, well, I don't know how you feel. Many, many times I, I bump into things and I've, I've, I bump into people that are desperate, that need housing, that need, and some of you have heard me say this, and, and I've said to my family, I wish I would have the finances to buy low-income housing so I could share with those. And they've said, no, if people take advantage of you. And I know that. I don't think that, well, let, let's leave that. But often I think that only if I had money like my brothers in church, if I had income like such and such a person, then I would be able to give. But if I look at Jesus' ministry, a lot of his giving was his, his generous heart. And he was giving in ways that didn't even involve money. It was his attitude. It was his way. And of course, none of us are able to heal the way that, that Jesus did. But it was his caring attitude for those that were brokenhearted and had no out. They were just there in his path. And you know what? They are there in our path too. Look around. I don't know if any of you can think of instances where you, could, you thought, oh, if only I would have just stopped and taken a little more time. I think I, can, I could get 10 of them in less than five minutes, 10 instances where I thought, oh, if only I would have just spoken a word of encouragement, if only I would have just known what to say, or if only I would have taken, now let me rephrase that. I knew that I should have, but I didn't take the opportunity because I had other things on my mind and other things going on. But Jesus did say that he came to heal, to preach the gospel to the poor, and to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. You know the verse. Now let me just continue to focus in on this. The more you invest in something, it seems like the more you see potential in that investment. And I, the, we could talk about reasons for investment, and I, I, this just, I can't cover every aspect of investment. I really don't want to think about it just in how we invest uh, our finances in hopes of getting a huge return. I'm guessing if I would at least talk about investment on this side of the men's side of the auditorium, all of us would have some wise advice for me and how I should invest and how I have missed the opportunity and now I'm 51 years old and I probably will never regain what I lost and all of that. I understand all of that. But there is a difference between investing in the kingdom with eternal values, looking for an eternal return versus something that will line my pocket and finally put me on the golf cart in Florida or somewhere posh where life is easy. There is a difference if, if that's our focus. But a few things do overlap. If our investment in the kingdom is just kind of on the fringe, on the border, then it's easy to leave it. Things turn up, well, yeah, hey, I kind of always knew it's going to turn out that way. I'll just kind of walk away from that thing. 
On the other hand, I know this sounds, I'm really exposing myself by saying this as a young man, and I hope you don't know me like this, but I was super laser focused on investing. And I, I don't know how long we were married, and I, I invested in some stock. And at that time, before a computer, well, computers, there were computers, but before I had a computer, I checked that investment every day, every day. And I either smiled or frowned, depending on which way it went. And I don't know if you men know what it's like to be in that mode. There is a, such a thing as investing in the kingdom and holding something that is not ours to hold. There is something like gripping something that is in God's hands, and I should let it go. I wasn't planning on saying that, but I, I, I really deal with that in the leadership, in, in my shoes, because sometimes I think, well, things that just didn't turn out the way I had hoped, or it, or it went a different direction. It wasn't mine to say. We keep sowing, we keep investing, and God takes care of the details, not me. I think Romans 12 has some uh, advice as far as investing, and I see that I'm, I really wanted this to be short and to the point, but Romans 12, the chapter of, of uh, Romans 12, there's, a, a, of course, a very, it's a very common uh, chapter, but it has some advice for the Christian in how they should be investing in the kingdom. And I'm just going to pick out a few verses and read. Uh, verse 9 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Being willing to not have the last word, but being kindly affection one to another, just getting along. And that theme is kind of threaded through that. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, verse 12, uh, continuing instant in prayer. And that those are investments in the kingdom of God that have eternal value. Rejoicing in hope. Let me just say a word to you. I don't know if I should even say this, but in Christmas time, we're, we're in the holiday season and in the holiday spirit. Maybe we think that. I don't know what we think, but I've just had enough experience, walked with enough people that for some, Christmas is a very difficult time where we kind of have this nostalgia where we think family ought to get together, everyone around the table, everyone has big smiles on their face, and every, everything is just right. And I'm saying this because I rejoice with those folks that have no turbulence in their lives. And this morning as I look at you, you all seem well-adjusted, at peace, everything looks just right. My guess is that a few of you have experienced a Christmas or two that didn't feel so well. And I'm saying this because... I think sometimes I miss the opportunity to minister and be there for those that maybe Christmas isn't perfect, but we're going we're gonna to celebrate anyway. We're, we're, we're not going to stop. We're going to celebrate because Jesus came. And let's be careful that we invest in that way. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. These are all things that as you look at the world, I cannot tell you how many times people, they, they long to have some connection. There's a loneliness in this world like never, but well, it's always been there. I'm just seeing it. People are wanting connection, and giving them connection is something that goes beyond money. I have verse 14 on the list here to read, bless them that curse, persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Let's be sensitive. I already talked about that. Let's be sensitive to those that are maybe facing some hard things. Weep with those that weep. I know I shouldn't say this. But well, yeah, I, let me re rephrase that. Maybe I should say this. Weep with those that weep. There are those that have struggles. There are those that have failed and maybe fulfilling the law of Christ, and they're crying because of their bad choices, don't shoot your fellow man. Christians that shoot each other really damage the kingdom. They're not investing in the kingdom at all. If criticism is all that we have for those that have failed, 
them probably were not investing. It's serious business. Try crying with those that haven't made the best choices. Try being compassionate with them. Try it. Just try it. Invest. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Mind not high things. Paul, I think, is saying, in my words, a Christ-like attitude of humility is an investment in the kingdom of God. It is investing. It is putting something in there that will last in eternity. And let me tell you this. I've stood beside caskets. You all have. And when you get to that place, it doesn't matter how big the farm was or how much money was there, but what matters is that connection with God and the values that that individual carried with them. That is all that matters at that point. All that matters. Egos aside, titles, rank, all of those things, don't, they don't matter anymore. We all know those things. But somehow when I get to that spot, it's at that point that I realize that all of those things that men and women strive for often don't amount to anything. But it's that eternal investment that matters. Let's do it. Jesus said, uh, if bringing a cup of cold water to someone in need is an investment in the kingdom. Ephesians 4.31, we know the verse um, talks about our speaking and how we should not speak against or bitterly against those. Those that profess to be Christian ought to be careful with their tongue. We live in a broken world. And if the church and God's people are not a place where others can go to for help, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? I'm not chastising anyone because I see it over and over again among the brother, brethren here, but I want to encourage us, invest in the kingdom. Don't stop. And if you fail in investing, go back and start because you're not going to answer to the bishop. You're going to answer to someone else if you don't invest properly. And then finally, Ephesians 4.32, being kind one to another is an, an investment. I think most of us would agree that the Bible, it's a principle that shot throughout Scripture. It's beyond just giving money. As a Christian, we, we profess to be born again, but how many times have we sent a frown someone's way or an unkind word someone's way or a judgment someone's way where we could have done something completely different and invested in the kingdom of God. We don't do, in this mode, if the love of God has filled our hearts and is overflowing, it is not a duty. It's something we do because we want to with joy. With joy. It's, something, it's the overflow of the heart. It's the law of Christ written in our hearts. I want to end with this well-known scripture passage in Matthew 25. I'm not going to read it because you all know uh, where I'm going with this. But we think, well, I've, I've showed up every Wednesday evening the last year. I've, I, did, I did bring carrots for every fellowship meal. I did, and then we kind of, we, and then there's some other things that we did. And we did pretty well, and we give us a scorecard, and, and uh, perhaps we even think that, well, if, if we're a preacher, we preach however many messages, and, and uh, somehow we, this brings some, it it's kind of soothes my heart, and it, it, it tells me that, yes, I have invested in the kingdom. And we know this, the, the passage in, in verse uh, 41 to 46, this is kind of the, the putting the last part first, those on his left. There's something about their response that really grabbed my attention. They were argumentative about their investment. And I've noticed that. Sometimes someone will, will invest, will, and I'm not talking about any, any one of you or any specific thing, but someone invests, but it seems more to me like they're doing their duty now. And I missed a whole lot of what I was going to, to share about just putting money in the offering basket or investing heavily in just 
one or the other. Maybe I'm investing heavily in family and I say, God gave me this family. I, I can't, you know, or just in the church and I'm constantly, or maybe we say, well, I have this mission out there across the sea. I'm investing in that. Don't, just don't fuss with me. I'm, I'm, my money's all going over there. And I think God would have us invest or be active in giving wherever he has us, wherever that is. And then that takes care of it. I don't like, sometimes I feel like an investment portfolio manager in church because there's this constant battle of where does it go? Who gets the most? And then there's this argument about, well, look at them. They've got that much. And maybe this segment of the church is doing that. And, and I think what we really need to do is just make sure that we're trying to manage all fronts instead of argue about it. Obviously, that's not what God wants us to do. But anyway, I noticed this. They, their response was, we did it. We had it under control. We did it. And God somehow didn't see it. And this is what I, I think is so sobering. Verse 34, well, the verses from 34 to 40 talk about those that came to that area and that judgment, and they hardly knew that they had given. They didn't even realize that they had given. Why? Because it was the law of Christ written in their hearts that was overflowing, and they were so it did not it did not pull them down or bog them down. They gave because they wanted to give, and they inherited eternal life. Eternal life, not internal life. Eternal life. Well, I have to close with, with those thoughts. I, I, there's, there's more that could be said, but I hope that this, um, this motivates us to invest or keep investing. I, I want to say this yet, just, just a few words. What is your motivation for investing? Our, our Sunday school lesson really just kind of touched me this morning. He was talking about the Jews. They were Jews. They were indeed, they were Jews. They had it just right. They looked just right. And it is so easy for Christians to, to feel like they're investing because that's just what we've always done. And this is the way we do it in our church. And there must be no other way to, to invest. And so it motivates this kind of, how do you want to say it? Our ideology just says we, we do this a certain way. What motivates you to invest in the Christian in the uh, Christian community or the kingdom, what motivates you? That is maybe more important than everything else that I said. What motivates you? If faith is not your fuel to invest, then you've missed the mark. If somehow I invest because it makes me look better, then I might as well just go home. I'm done. I'm not getting to heaven. I'm not, I'm not even a Christian. If, if that's the reason. And I know this is a gray area where, where we can hide and sometimes... Well, let me just leave it there. If faith is not our fuel for investing, if ego or position or rank or title or anything else is our motivation for investing, then we're Christian in name only. We're not really Christians. I will tell you something that's personal to me. One of the reasons I feel motivated to keep investing and this may seem completely off to you, but one of the reasons I am motivated to keep giving is because I see my own brokenness. I see my own need. I see many times when I come up to situations that just feel so broken, I, re I really realize, I, I told a group of people last week, forget it. I may be a pastor, but I'm really just a beggar showing another beggar where a piece of bread is. I'm no better than anyone else, and I realize that on a daily basis, and that is why, that is what keeps me going. Maybe one of the only reasons, because I know what it feels like to have missed the mark, to not be perfect, and have someone encourage me to keep going. So, what am I saying? Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep going, but for the right reason. Keep investing in the kingdom of God.
Would you stand with me for a closing prayer here? Our loving Father in heaven, we pause to acknowledge you. We pause to ask for supernatural strength to keep investing in the kingdom. And we do this with joy, Father. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that even though sometimes our investments fail, you can take our little effort and make it into something beautiful. Father, I pray that you would bless everyone here that has with a sincere heart and humility invested in the kingdom, invested in your kingdom. Father, bless them and give them strength, young and old, to continue on walking in truth. Lord, we plead that your spirit would fill our hearts, would just overflow to those lives and our families, all that are around us, wherever we go. So please, Lord, surround this place, surround our hearts. Bless the individuals that are here this morning whoever they are, that need to hear some encouragement to keep going. Father, I pray yet against the powers of darkness that bring darkness and that hinder us and that keep us from, from going forward. I, I pray against the powers of darkness in Jesus' name, Father. And I just ask, Lord, for a joy that would be in this brotherhood that would bring life and bring it more abundantly. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.